Okay. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be looking at several tantalizing artworks. There are actually hundreds of them, but we just have to make a selection. Depicting royal mistresses or favorites of, as they were known, of French monarchs executed by artists of the two periods of the Ecole de Fontainebleau, the Fontainebleau School, uh, as it's known in French, Ecole de Fontainebleau. Each portrait also invites us to consider the question of stylized representation and what's underneath that, contrasted with the truth. There we are. The first school is circa uh, 1526 to 1570. Uh, it included Italian artists um, invited by this chap, François Premier, to decorate his chateau not far from Paris at Fontainebleau, hence the name of the school. The first um, painting we're going to look at is, uh, the first portrait belongs to an anonymous painting from the second Ecole de Fontainebleau from 1594 to 1617 unactive under Henri IV, 1553 to 1610, when he was pruned off, he was executed by a madman called Ravaillac. Uh, he was Henry IV of France, Henri IV de France, and Henri III de Navarre, Henry III of Navarre. Yes. The painting's held in the Richelieu wing of the Louvre, and it's pretty famous, a lot of people go to see it. Um, it's believed to have been painted about 1594. We're going to have a close-up, a larger version, so we can see it. In this painting, we see two beautiful naked young women in the bath, assumed by the majority of art critics to be Gabrielle Destrée, the king's favorite, his mistress, the blonde-haired woman on the right, and her sister, the Duchesse de Villars, the duchess on the left. Both women wear simple pearl earrings, as we shall see, highly significant adornments in the iconology of the era. The Duchesse de Villa rests her right arm along the bath and extends her left arm towards her sister, whose nipple she holds between her thumb and forefinger. This is a very provocative image, which has given rise to lots of speculation. In her left hand, Gabrielle Destrée holds out a sapphire ring towards the viewer. In the background, a fire burns. Beside it, an elegantly dressed servant sits sewing. You'll see, we'll see in a lot of these paintings, there's a servant tucked in often, as there is in the poetry of the period. Next to the fireplace, there's a small mirror, and over the fireplace hangs a painting, the bottom half of which can be glimpsed. Many art historians have alluded to the veiled eroticism of this painting. For today's viewer, it is an enigma. We can't, we have to unpack what's underneath it. It seems to contain a narrative which we are at pains to work out. The red curtains framing the painting su suggest that a play is about to unfold. We've got a spectacle about to happen. What exactly does it mean within the context of 16th century thought? While some modern day commentators have seen it an ex as an example of sapphic or lesbian love, Looking at the portrait within the conventions of the era in which it was painting, painted quickly dispels this idea. But first of all, before unraveling the mystery, we need to find out more about its principal subject. Uh, who exactly was Gabrielle Destrée? Her dates from 1573 until 1599 tell us that this beautiful young woman issuing from an ancient noble line in Picardy, uh, died at the early age of 26. Contemporaries described her in glowing terms, so she's not only painted as beautiful, she's described by women, too, in very glowing terms. Blonde, dorée, d'une taille admirable, I'll translate you for you in a minute, d'un teint d'une blancheur éclatante. Blonde, golden, with an admirable figure, and a dazzlingly white skin, all important in this portrait. One of 11 children, Gabrielle had six sisters, jokingly called by their fathers, the seven deadly sins. Les sept péchés capitaux, so dad must have had quite a sense of humor. What was significant about her life as it led to this painting was that she was the mistress of the monic, whom I've just mentioned in connection with the Ecole de Fontainebleau. 
um, Henri IV of France, King of Navarre, raised a Protestant, unusually, by his mother, Jeanne d'Albret, and his grandmother, the famous Marguerite d'Angoulême, or Marguerite de Navarre, poet, Protestant, sister to the Catholic François Premier, we saw in the second slide. Henri was famous for abjuring his Protestant faith. He wasn't going to be able to rule as king if he was a, a Protestant. And he said, Paris vaut une messe. Paris is worth a mass. It's worth becoming a Catholic to be able to rule. He embraced Catholicism. He was passionately attracted to Gabrielle, whom he met towards the end of 1590, when she was the mistress of another man. Though at first she resisted Henry, Henri, uh, she's very funny the way she described him. She eventually ceded and became his mistress in 1591. What she said, which is absolutely delicious in French, il sent l'ail et le gousset, he smells of garlic and the gusset, referring obviously to all the, with the womanizing he did, but uh, she eventually gave in. She received many titles from him and bore him three children. On the 10th of April, 1599, already six months pregnant by Henri with another child, Gabrielle died during the night. Earlier, on the 23rd of February that year, 1599, Henri had publicly declared his intention to wed her, to wed his mistress. Some believed she was poisoned, the convulsions she experienced suggesting this, but nowadays we think she had eclampsia, which raised her, her um, tension arterielle, what's that, um, blood pressure, and caused her to convulse and turn black and all kinds of things, really awful. Um, the, this is the quote from Henri on her death. He said in French, it's beautiful, mon affliction est aussi incomparable que l'était le sujet qui me la donne. Les regrets et les plaintes m'accompagneront jusqu'au tombeau. So, uh, this is my translation, my affliction is incomparable as a subject, namely the woman, which causes it, regrets and outpourings of grief, beautiful in French, plant, it does a lot of things, will accompany, accompany me right to the tomb. This painting of Gabrielle d'Estrée is only one of a whole series of interlinked artworks with the twin themes of a woman in the bath or at her toilette, at her dressing table. There's lots and lots of paintings. We can only look at a few. The prototype of the woman in the bath is a beautiful painting by Francois Clouet of 1571 from the first school. Of I've got a frozen shoulder, so I have to lean over and do it with the other arm. Um, it's thought to depict the mistress of a forebear of Henri IV. Henri II. Uh, who, revealing to the world his love for a woman 18 years his senior, um, and playing on the goddess whose name she bore, her name was Diane de Poitiers, Diana, it's like the goddess, interlaced the letter H, you see this, with the symbol of his mistress, the crescent moon, a motif found throughout all the poetry of the period and many of the portraits. Um, at the age of 38, Diane became mistress of the 19-year-old Henri. She had actually been put in charge of his education. What, some education? And uh, her older brother, too, François, the Dauphin, was also the two, by François Premier, the chap we saw on the second slide, entrusted to this very, very smart woman um, the education of his sons. Well, François died, and Henri became the Dauphin, and she became his mistress. She was 38, and he was 18. Um, he gave her this very posh chenonceau which some of you may know, yeah, and it's always been owned by women. This beautiful essay written by Marguerite Yulsena on Chenonceau. It's lovely, this beautiful castle. Um, yes, where are we up to? Uh, yes, so she gave him this, he gave her rather this castle. She was actually a very cunning businesswoman too. She was a bit like Elle McPherson, you know, sort of beautiful and quite, you know, Intelli sort of intelligent and smart, rusé, they would say in French. She's a really smart woman. She remained his favorite, his mistress, until his death at the age of 40, subsequent to a jousting accident. I don't know if you, any of you know about this. This is just a horrendous death. He was jousting, as, you know, chaps did, 
and he got a lance through his eye and he was operated on by the most famous, wonderful Ambroise Paré, the father of modern surgery. But of course he died 10, he succumbed, died 10 days later, there'd be no, uh, no anything, you know, to stop him getting infected or whatever. Um, so back to the painting of Beyond the Poitiers. So in this painting, which is a prototype really to the later ones, uh, meant to be painted, we think, about 1571. So we've got a beautiful young woman, believed to be Diane de Poitiers. You will we'll notice that with a lot of the paintings and the different portraits of Diane de Poitiers, her hair changes colour, and I don't think she changed it, but it's an interesting idea, and, you know, truth, representation, and so on. She's seated in the bath, and she's in the right. Though naked, her hair under a little headpiece is beautifully arranged. It's, very, it's a beautiful painting. A bracelet on her left arm and jewellery in her hair adorn her perfect form. In her right hand, she holds a red flower. In front of her, a covered board reveals a dish piled up with fruit and scattered leaves and flowers. Behind her to the right, a small boy reaches for the bunches of grape, grapes in the dish. Further back to the left of the painting, a rough-featured wet nurse suckles a swaddled infant. We'll find this motif again and again and again of the sort of rough-featured wet nurse, because all these um, noble women weren't breastfeeding their own kids, obviously, and there was a whole sort of tradition, of course, of wet nurses that we get in Romeo and Juliet, too. Uh, a sumptuous room can be seen with a comely servant bearing a large pot, perhaps water for the fire. Through the window, foliage is glimpsed. There's a small mirror and below it, a chair adorned with a unicorn. Now, all these symbols are highly important for understanding the painting. Keys to interpret these paintings are provided by the iconology, that study of imagery at the time, and the mythology, and by Petrarchism, which I'll come back to, the legacy of the famous 14th century poet, Francesco Petrarca, um, Petrarch. Concepts with which we are no longer familiar Works such as Cesare Reaper's Iconologia, so Iconology, or Alciati's Book of Emblems, uh, Liber Emblemati, were complemented by the writings of many mythographers at the time. And each of the works functioned like a, uh, as a series of compendia, instructing poets and painters what they should do, how they should present, use the appropriate symbols so that people could read the poem, understand the poem, or understand the, the artwork. Because it reflects the evanescent image of the world, the mirror, which we find again and again in these paintings, was often a symbol of the transitory nature of temporal things leading to death, um, and hence was asso associated with the need to carpe diem, to seize the day. This theme of carpe diem, seizing the day of woman's ephemeral beauty and she should better let herself be loved now while she's young and of the consequent need, the need to be loved and to love when she's young and beautiful is thus subtly introduced into many of the paintings. I've some of the poems that some of you may know. Uh, it resonates throughout the whole 16th century and it's in f French poetry, Italian poetry, uh, English poetry, so we've got, and it was a Latin, used on, based on Latin mod models, hence the Carpe Diem. Ronsard's, quand vous serez bien vieille au soir à la, à la chandelle. So th um, that's when you're old and decrepit in the evening, sitting by your candlelight. He's trying to persuade her to yield to him, the poet, Pierre de Ronsard, had got a lot of women in his life. And it ends with, cueillez des aujourd'hui les roses de la vie. So gather roses while you're young and beautiful, gather the roses of life. And we also know this poem was reworked by Yeats, the Irish poet. Some of you may know his version, which is very interesting. Uh, or Andrew Marvel's To His Coy Mistress, in which the poet um, exhorts his beloved to sport while we may. Uh, they're all examples of this theme of carpe diem. So the act of loving and of being loved is in fact exactly what these beautiful women are doing. They're exactly what they're engaged in. 
since classical times too, I referred to the symbols that you see, the mirror and so on. The mirror has also had an association with Venus, goddess of love, a motif revived by Titian and widespread in the early modern period, which is now the new sexy way of saying the, the Renaissance. We, we all know Renaissance and Rinascimento in Italian, but now we say the early modern period. So the theme of love offered by the young woman, whose beauty is goddess-like, like Venus, is evoked. The nakedness of the women portrayed associates each one of them with Venus, who's traditionally, often, very usually, portrayed as naked. The water in the bath constitutes another implicit reference to Venus, who we all remember from Botticelli, I'll show you in a minute, in classical mythology was miraculously born from the sea and came to land, born by a shell. So there she is, that beautiful Botticelli. So that's, that's our Venus. Um, so the bath water and all the water in all these is constantly reminding us of, of the goddess Venus. Um, so the theme of Venus, it's called Anadiomen. That means the watery Venus. It's one of those hard words... I have to, you have to write out Anadio Man in French. A watery Venus is a very, very frequent, uh, a frequent motif in, in art and in, in literature. Um, this next slide here. The Cupid's heads and shell on the mirror in another one of the interrelated many Fontainebleau paintings, this one held in Dijon, reinforce the Venus connection. I noticed some, it's lovely, this Artemis exhibition on, and I come to Artemis again in a minute, Diana. The association with Venus is heightened by the flowers in some of the paintings, a symbol not only of the perfection of female beauty, but also of the ephemeral nature of that beauty, and as such, an important ingredient, ingredient of the Carpe Diem poems. In, for example, which Louise would know, Mignon, allons voir si la rose. Let's go out, darling, and let's see if that rose has lost its petals. You see, it has. So, you know, the, it, beauty doesn't last long. So this is Ronsard once again trying to persuade the beautiful um, uh, Cassandra to yield to him. As Guy de Ter Tervaron reminds us, mentioned in my flyer, in his Attributes et Symboles dans la Profane, which is attributes and symbols in secular art, and he calls it Dictionnaire d'un langage perdu. It's Dictionary of a, of a Lost Language. We don't know this language, and we have to learn it. Uh, the fire burning in the background of each of these paintings is an image of passion. There's also another very important influence. We've got the iconology. We'll come to the literature again. Yes, I'm just going to now. But the iconology, mythology are all very, very important in this. And there's another very important influence. And that, as I mentioned, is Petrarchism from the 14th century poet Francesco Petrarca. In celebrating in his Canzonieri his love for the beautiful Laura de Noblesse, but she would be Lor in French. She was actually French, but in Italian she's Laura. Uh, glimpsed on Good Friday, 1327, at the Church of St. Clair in Vaucluse, France, Petrarch laid down a formulaic recipe for feminine beauty. I might add that <laughs> Petrarch spent his whole life writing about unrequited love, about this gorgeous woman mad to somebody else, you know, and that he glimpsed only, didn't ever actually even meet or anything. It's, it's wonderful, but it's gorgeous stuff. So according to the Petr Petrarchan ideal, this is exactly coming from Petrarch, the woman's hair is gold, her forehead alabaster, her eyes are stars, her cheeks roses, her lips cherry or coral, her complexion has roses in it and it's like a lily, her teeth are white pearls. Fruit, flowers and precious jewels found in these paintings all bear witness to the lady's loveliness. It is this Petrarchan ideal that Shakespeare is satirizing in his famous sonnet of 130, which begins, My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. He continues systematically lampooning, sending up the conceits of the tradition and ends by disavowing the resemblance of his mistress to a goddess. He says, I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. So Shakespeare's having enormous fun sending up the whole Petrarchan tradition. If we another painting, 
painting from uh, the Fontainebleau series, Damas à Toilette in the Kunstmuseum in Basel, and look at it in the light of Petrarchum, Petrarchism, sorry, the painting becomes much clearer. This is revealed in a brilliant work, uh, which I read many years ago, The Icy Fire, Five Studies in European Petrarchism, because um, the lover burns on ice. There's all these conceits and contradictions all over the place. Um, it's by a very fine book by Leonard Forster. So he says, looking at this painting, the jewels held up against the naked skin of the woman evoke the Petrarchan conceit of her beauty being comparable to precious stones. The servant rummaging in a jewel chest reinforces the image. The frame of the mirror in which you see her face reflected is studded with coral, which in the original is not as bright as the reflection of the, her lips in the mirror. So she outdoes all this, all the jewels and so on. The gold setting of the jewels she's wearing are dimmer than the gold of her hair. Certainly in the, in the original, you see it very clearly. The ruby on the chain around her neck uh, are dimmer. The ruby is dimmer than the gold. Oh, sorry, I've jumped. The ruby on the chain around her neck refers to the pink of her nipples. Though her teeth are not visible, the pearls in her necklace constitute a reference to them. The comb, which has important iconological associations with Venus, Venus is often presented with a comb, also constitutes a reference to the many treatments in Petrarch. One aspect which differs from Petrarchan love is the sensual and sexual aspect of the love in all these paintings. Petrarchan love, as I said, is a chaste, sublimated form. The lover burns in the fires of unrequited love. But the inclusion in this painting, and in many of them, of an amorous couple supporting a bejeweled mirror and of a four-post bed in the background, and in the case of many of them, uh, of a child and a wet nurse, uh, a child, a wet nurse suckling a baby, comment on the nature of the love. It's not, it's not Petrarchan love at all. It's um, real sexual love. Um, so if we go back to the sister in the bath, uh, if we look at this painting again, bringing, into my, bringing to bear on it iconology, mythology, Petrarchism, uh, but th so we think about all these, I think that it becomes much clearer, I hope so. Gabrielle represents an idealised woman according to the Petrarchan formula, reinforced in written accounts of her beauty. A lot of people did say she was extremely beautiful. Uh, the white cloth lining her bath alludes to the whiteness, softness, and del delicacy of her skin, as does the gauze cloak in the Basel painting we've just seen. The pearls in her ears suggest both the lustrous quality of her skin <clears throat> as well as the perfect form of her teeth. Her hair is of an exquisite golden hue. Her eyes are perfect blue deeper than the blue of the sapphire of the ring. It's hard to see in, in reproductions, but the original shows it. Uh, her nipple is a perfect jewel, the balancing gesture of her hand holding the jewel, corresponding to her sister's hand holding her nipple, and thus forming a visual and mannerist conceit, as Roland Barthes, the critic, has said. He's an art critic. He wrote on mythology, an amazing man, French critic. Gabrielle is a Venus-like goddess in her watery medium, capable, as the fire in the background reminds us, of inciting a fire of passion in the heart of her lover, the man she is to wed, as her extended hand with the ring suggests. Another reason for the ring, she's going to be married to the monarch. That she is with child is implied by the gesture of her sister seizing her nipple, the servant sewing the background alludes perhaps to the making of clothes for the new infant, as the red curtains framing the painting suggest, all is set to unfold in a perfect performance, though it didn't because she died before she could wed him. Though she's beautiful in accordance with the Petrarchan formula, the love she incites, as I said in all these paintings, is far from a chaste Petrarchan one. The erotic nature of the love is hinted at by the spread eagled legs in the picture on the wall in the Louvre painting. The, um, the golden hair that we get on Gabriel Estre and some of the other, a lot of the other paintings, is so prevalent, so widespread. As we saw with um, 
we saw with Botticelli, Venus has got gorgeous sort of gold locks. And this golden hair, uh, the golden hair here, in this early 16th century painting of Flora, used in an exhibition held in 216, uh, uh, 2016, sorry, at the Academia in Venice. It, once again, it's all pervasive. They're often, women are often painted with gold hair, even if they didn't have golden, <laughs> gold hair, um, blonde hair. But what of Diane de Poitiers? As the Clouet portrait and written accounts reveal, she was a brunette with brown eyes. Um, this didn't prevent artists from portraying her. It's back to this truth and representation that I've been thinking about a lot within Petrarchan conventions as having golden hair, as in this painting where, drawing on her name, she's Diana, the goddess of hunt hunting. She's depicted, at, depicted as a virgin goddess, Diane Chasseresse in French, Diana the Huntress, which is a very, very prevalent image throughout in the poetry of the period too, because you get the idea of being wounded by the woman, wounded by her beauty and so on. Petrarchan conceit too. Uh, or in, you see it, uh, in accordance with this Petrarchan conceit of wounding by love, she was very, Diane de Poitiers was frequently portrayed as Diana the Huntress, uh, as I said, a theme used in the poetry of the period a lot too, and also in a portrayal of Gabrielle d'Estrée, uh, and one of the major love poem, poem collections of 1544, the Delhi, which is a shorthand for Diana, Delia, who was born on the island of Delos, um, brilliant poem, poems by 449 ten-liners by a brilliant um, Lyon, Lyon poet called Maurice Serre. Gorgeous stuff, absolutely beautiful. Um, so, um, drawing on other aspects of the mythological side of Diana of Artemis, uh, in accordance, sorry if I moved away, should I, should I run that past you again? Well, you're right. So, drawing on mythology in other depictions of Diana and Diane de Poitiers, and in accordance with her personal symbol of the crescent moon, artists frequently portray her, portray Henri Deux's mistress as moon goddess, as in this beautiful painting where she has a little crescent moon sitting on her, on a hair, a bit like a sort of tiara. Um, this it's beautiful. Um, this portrait by Prima Ticcio of the beautiful uh, de Diane de Poitiers, who lived to an astonishing age, uh, very late for the time. She lived to 66, and that's very old for someone in the 16th century. This will serve as final artwork in my overview of these paintings of royal mistresses. So a familiarization with iconology, which is the use of uh, symbols and, and images, mythology, and the Petrarchan Code as it pertains to female beauty, all serve to illuminate the portraiture of the period by revealing the conventions on which it was constructed. While we're in a century and we're, in which we're sensitive to the notion of the gaze, and particularly the male gaze, each mistress portrayed in these paintings is confident in her depiction as goddess, as Petrarchan beauty. They're not flinching or doing this, they're pretty strong who holds sway, she holds sway over the most powerful man in the realm. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. It's lovely that you, you've come. And I, what I'm going to end on, and some of you might have questions, I'm going to leave you with a picture. This is a picture of my husband and, my, uh, and me dancing a bavan, which is a stately dance yeah, that would be gorgeous in a minute. I'll put it on. In a concert of French music and dance held here at UWA in 1977, there's been a long tradition of fabulous, fantastic emphasis on the 16th century, you know, from wonderful people that Johnny so kindly mentioned, um, Beverly Ormerod, Beverly Ormerod in French, uh, um, people in Italian, people in French and so on. And um, what we were dancing to, and it's a gorgeous work, which I sang in France with a group, of Petit Groupe, we did all 16th century stuff. And my son, who's got a beautiful bass, whenever he used to come back from a and used to walk in the house, and he'd add this really beautiful Russian bass to it. And he, he knew it too, he learnt, learnt it from French friends. So if we put that on, just a bit of that um, 
music. It's Bel Kitchama. saying don't don't be rebellious to me you know because my my heart is yours and um, and he says you know why do you flee from me and so on and if you don't allow me to kiss you I'm gonna die <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous stuff and it really encapsulates that whole idea in the 16th century and all these beautiful uh, collections written and paintings done of one one woman or in the case of Gabriel Sway with her sister in the bath, but it's um, it's lovely stuff and it, it's a gorgeous a gorgeous pavan, which is a very um, stately dance um, based on the idea of pe peacocking, being like a peacock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.